In today's video, we're talking about the world we live in and live in Hamburg. Although my review may be wrong, it may even be perverted. and welcome once again to Piano and Keyboard Artist where we discuss everything about artists relating to pianos, keyboards and synthesizers. And today we're talking about one of my personal favourites, it's Depeche Mode Live in Hamburg. Now if you're familiar with my style, the first part of this video we're going to run through this uh, awesome concert in a lot of detail talking about personal experiences, uh, completely unscripted and just talking to you as if though you were sitting in the room with me right now. If you've just, and a word of warning, if you've just stumbled across this channel or if it's your first time here, I would like to welcome you to the channel, but I do wish to warn you that if you're expecting a concise, structured, soulless and to the point factual review regarding Depeche Mode's Live in Hamburg concert in 1984, if that's what you're expecting, then I suggest you leave now, because that is not how we roll on this channel. We're random, unscripted, perhaps a little bit off the wall, but that's how we roll. So if this is not your cup of tea, I respectfully ask you to leave now and spare yourself 20 minutes of pain. And to you new guys who are choosing to stay, welcome. And to my subscribers, I love you as always, guys. And let's jump right into this. <laughs> So Depeche Mode Live in Hamburg was released in 1985 and it was recorded on the 14th of December 1984 in the Alsterdorfer Sportshalle in Hamburg. Uh, that's my dodgy trying to sound German. Uh, Alsterdorfer Sportshalle. I think Sportshalle, is that a sports hall? Sports meaning sport and Halle is a hall. Anyway, and that was in Hamburg. Um, yeah, 14th of December. 75 minutes and 57 seconds, if you need to know that as well. This was an awesome concert. Um, I put up a post in my Facebook uh, group yesterday and said that my favorite Depeche Mode sort of concerts of all times would be Live in Hamburg, Devotional and 101. Devotional obviously being my most favorite one, but, but if you listen to 101 and if you were to compare it to, say, Live in Hamburg, I find Live in Hamburg to be a more honest performance. When I say honest, obviously 101 was a honest live performance, but I mean we've talked about it a lot in this uh, on this channel, um, was the soundtrack we hear on the 101 uh, recording, the, you know, the one that most of us grew up with and is so deeply ingrained into us. That record, it's very well known that it was very edited and almost produced and that was obviously because during the 101 concert they had you know, severe sound problems and all that. But that's another subject. Um, do check out my Depeche Mode 101 reviews. I'll post the link in the description below. But let's remain on topic before the off-topic chicken jumps all over me again. Depeche Mode, the world we live in live in Hamburg, will always have a special place in my heart because I remember owning it on VHS cassette and indeed some of you have reached out to me th through, through the Facebook group and said, you know, you had it on Sony Betamax. Well, wow. and to those younger subscribers, um, I want to tell you that this was the time before the internet existed. Uh, this was the time when you'd go to a concert and you'd stand at the stage and you would watch the concert. You wouldn't hold your phone, you know, you wouldn't watch it through your phone. I think it was Jarvis Cocker who once quite brilliantly said, he said, why would you watch a concert through something the size of a cigarette packet when it's happening right in front of you? Anyway, are we going off topic? But yeah, guys, I mean, this was the time before the internet and it was a good time. Bootlegs, dodgy VHS cassettes, dodgy cassettes. It was a magical time. And, and to you, the younger subscribers or the younger generation who were born too late, um, I'm not trying to tell you that you've missed out in life by being, by being born too late, but you probably have just a little bit. But don't worry, it's all good. So the concert kicks off with down, 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 down. Dun, 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 dun. And 
the very in the very first frame we see Dave Garn standing and we see Fletcher getting all hyped up in the corner. Good old Fletch getting all hyped up and getting ready to go and clap. So they use the dun 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 and Dave goes ah! Then it goes dun 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 Where do I start? My little girl, won't you come with me? Come with me. As soon as Dave Garn opens his mouth, he's, you can hear it's this fresh, youthful, energetic. This was Depeche Mode at their prime. Um, just the energy. I'm going to really try and remain on topic for this because there are so many emotions and ideas that come to me now. But if I think of the filming of this concert, what was really nice about the filming of this was all the various ca camera angles we got. And I looked, as much as I love the devotional uh, uh, concert, the, the, the release, my only real criticism about the devotional uh, concert was the, the fact that it was filmed in so many sort of like wide and long shots. And, you know, it was directed by on Anton Corbijn and it wasn't badly done. Uh, certainly wasn't. It was, it was, it was epic. But um, I think I just would like to have seen more, you know, um, video footage from on the stage and, you know, filmed from the sides of the keyboard players and, you know, seeing what they're playing. Because everything in Devotional was filmed sort of, you know, from the front as if though you were watching them on stage. And this is what I liked about the Live in Hamburg show was uh, I, I loved the way they edited it, you know, where the there were scenes where you 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 could see three members on the screen at the same time. They kind of crossfaded it, and um, it was just really great as a you know as a, as a musician and a, and a keyboard player and a, and, a, and, a, and an inspiring learning keyboard player I was at the time to sort of see Alan Wilder, you know, in his prime. So it was really good to see the cameras filming them so that you could see what they were playing. And this is how I learned to play keyboards, guys. As you know, I'm self-taught, and um, I used to sit with this VHS uh, video cassette. Uh, with a remote control so that it would be on TV and then I would sit in, in the living room on the ground on the floor and I'd have a my very first keyboard was a Kawai FS660 I remember buying that about a hundred years ago and I bought this thing and I couldn't even play it but I was keen and determined to learn and I remember live in Hamburg was my first musical tuition because it wasn't like these days, guys, you know, the young, you know, you're, you're younger guys where you can just go to YouTube and you go, oh, how do I do that? Type it into YouTube. Oh, I do. And to avoid going off topic, I think younger people these days just don't know the struggle it was. Um, so for me, when I bought my first keyboard wanting to learn, the only way I could learn was to watch this VHS cassette of Depeche Mode Live in Hamburg. And I used to sit and watch it over and over and I'd rewind it and then I'd, I'd put it on slow motion. And then I'd say, okay, his finger's there, let me try that. Uh, uh, two minute warning. Oh wow, yeah, and, and that's, how, that's how I learned to play, guys. And our, that old VHS cassette, I don't have it anymore. I think it just, it just got so worn over time. But um, So you get the idea, this uh, show was very, very important to me and impacted me in, in, in many, many ways. So after something to do, which was explosive and great way to start a concert, uh, they went on to do Two Minute Warning. We're lying by the orange sky. What a song. As I say, I've watched this concert millions of times, but obviously I've had to watch it again, you know, to refresh, refresh myself for this uh, review. And it's funny when you go back to things that you've seen many years ago with a fresh and an older perspective, it's only then that you realize how bloody good they are because, you know, it's, I'm also looking at, looking at it with the knowledge of, you know, a producer and, and in my two cents worth, I'm thinking, I know what was available in those days, technology wise, and, you know, what they did, God, guys, I really, really want to interview Gareth Jones one day. I just think, I don't think Gareth Jones gets enough credit, you know, for the, the trilogy he did you know, the construction time again, some great reward, black celebration. Right, so two minute warning. And what was evident throughout this concert was they really, really were advertising the fact that they, they were sort of like an industrial pop act, pop band or whatever you wanted to call them. 
and that sampling was such an important part of their sound and that is why they had the um they had like a bicycle wheel there for blasphemous rumors they had like corrugated iron and all kinds of metallic objects that they could hit you know more for the visual effect but the sound of that record uh, of the show was so good you know the way they went on to replicate the, the the records in a live performance but do it so true to the the record but at the same time not having it be too much of a carbon copy of the record they, they did a fantastic job and this was Depeche Mode you know it, this period sort of up until devotional was was was, was peak okay so two minute warning dun, 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 dun. And then they go on to do, if you want, working weeks come to a stand. What a song. I would have said at the time that if you want is probably one of my all time favorite top 10 Depeche Mode songs. I'm probably going to put it in my top five now. And we always talk about, and we all know how Alan Wilde always talks about, oh, he's not a songwriter. He's just a a uh, creator of atmospheres and you know sound and you know musical landscapes by his own admission he said he's not a, a songwriter however um, I am going to do a video on the songs that Alan Wilder wrote and contributed to Depeche Mode and Alan I have to disagree with you because I think the songs that you write the songs that Alan Wilder wrote are probably some of my favorite call it nostalgia but if you want is to me definitely probably Alan Wilder's best Depeche Mode song and indeed one of the best of the whole catalogue and um, you guys should listen to the demo of If You Want uh, it's actually got Alan Wilder singing it and oh, it's, it's just got like this claustrophobic, claustrophobic kind of creepy not in a bad way it's just it's it's just it's hard to it's hard for me to explain it but it's it's, it's just absolute genius and when, you know when you listen to it you just go oh my god how is he doing that you know and especially with the technology they had at the time. Guys, the older I get, the more I have to just say Depeche Mode are just... What can I say? They deserve to be where they are, definitely. Okay, so if you want, this was a great performance. And this was the ultimate version of If You Want. And this is a song which they kind of scrapped from their live playlists. I don't think they ever did this after sort of... 86 after I think they may have done it during the black celebration tour as well But I think after that they've just scrapped it and they certainly wouldn't do it anymore now Having said it, I would hate to hear them do it now just the way they butcher some of these songs with the live drumming and Peter Gordino's Jazzy piano. I just wouldn't want to hear it. But anyway, that's another subject So if you want starts off with all these little sparklers and lighters it's dum -dum 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 -dum. But what I love about this is you've got Dave singing the working weeks come to a stand in his dark baritone. But then you've got Alan Wilder singing the same melody. So he's not singing a harmony. He's singing in the same key. So he's going working week. Uh, Alan Wilder's essentially singing the same line, but in a lighter voice. So when Dave's going working weeks come to a stand, really like direct. Alan's going, working weeks come to a stand, very direct. And the way, that was cl classic mode, was the way often when Dave would sing and Alan would sing over him, well, you know what I mean, at the same time, in, in the same key, and then Martin would provide the harmonies, and this was classic, classic, classic mode. Anyway, so if you want, and I love the way it starts, do 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 buzz. Buzz, buzz, do 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 buzz, buzz, buzz. So in order to create that buzz, 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 whatever, Alan Wilder would be using the Master and Servant sample, which is... But instead of holding it down for the full duration, in order to get the whole... He literally just went... So as you can hear. Bust, bust, bust. Bust, bust, bust. 
And then exercise your basic right. We could build a building site. What a song. And as I say, I need to dedicate a whole video to this song because it's incredible. I'd like to break it down and just geek out about it, probably in the Geek Talk series. Um, and then at the end, once again, it's got a really incredible ending where Dave goes, he sings like in this crescendo, which is executed brilliantly with, you know, with the, the right vocal effects and everything. And then they end with the, which once again is the Master and Servant sample. And this time it's, Simply that. People are people was the next track. It's great, they've got this sample just on the one key. As I say, that's kind of like a Fletch part. But it's on the Alan Wilder sound bank. Then it's got the, and so we're different colors and we're different creeds. And then Alan goes. Something like that. Yeah, um, the people are people version, awesome. I, as I said, I don't have any criticisms on this concert really. I call me biased, but I think as far as mode history goes, it's it's flawless. They then went on to do Leave in Silence, which was probably one of the best versions I've certainly heard, you know, as far as recordings go. What can I say? It was just outstanding. And um, I loved the, um, that fat Jupiter 8 uh, keyboard uh, sound that um, Alan Wilder played. Something like that, and he goes on to do the solo at the end. And he, doo -doo -doo -doo, I should learn that, and then he goes at the end, he goes. Uh, brilliant, and I just love the way Dave does the old spin. Uh, brilliant. New Life, definitely the best live version of New Life I've heard. Just the sounds and everything, and it just brilliantly, brilliantly worked. I love that version of New Life. Um, on the keyboards, Martin had a Yamaha keyboard on the top. It was a CS, go and help me, what was it? It was a Yamaha. And at the bottom he had an emulator. And then Alan Wilder had an emulator at the top and he had a Jupiter 8 at the bottom and I believe Fletch had an Oberheim. And as I say, this is in the days where they actually actually use synthesizers, whereas these days they don't usually actually use synthesizers. They just use master or controller keyboards. They do use access viruses, um, uh, Peter Gordino does, but back in those days they actually used a lot of synthesizers. And then, oh shame. Du -du 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 oh, and then Dave does that, I call it like the Taming the Python dance. Um, du -du 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 -du. It's funny, I'm not really talking through this review, I'm just making sounds with my voice and it, it it's a feeling, guys. That was a brilliant version of Shame. Um, once again, just listening to this the other day, I realized, oh my God, this was really like innovative. And I think at the time as well, you know, it was, you know, we fast forward to the current days, you know, I'd hate to be cynical, but when we listen to music now, it's very seldom that you'll hear something that you haven't heard before. That's not to say you won't hear something you haven't, that, that you don't like. It just means that when you hear new music, you tend to go, oh, I like that, but it's, it's not like back then when, you know, these things hadn't been done before. So whenever you heard of something, it was like, it was like mind blowing. So, and Shame was one of those, one of those songs. Shame. Do, 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 do. Speechless. Then in traditional Depeche Mode style, we get to the part of the set where Dave leaves the stage, Martin goes down to the front and he sings a song. And this time it was Somebody. Very good version. I haven't got any criticism on the show, guys, really. It's probably hard for me to criticize because, you know, I kind of grew up with it, so it's very difficult to see it in a neutral kind of way. I guess I'm very protective over it. So Martin just sang the one song, Dave comes out and does Lie to Me. Um, and this is a thing I've noticed with Depeche Mode songs usually, uh, even in current times, is when Dave walks off and then Martin comes and sings his song. And then when Dave comes back on again, they usually start off with something quite mellow. You know, sort of like Lie to Me, which is 
talking about Lie to Me, what a beautifully moody, melancholic, claustrophobic, emotional, sexual song. You can see why I could never work as a reviewer for NME, because can you imagine what my columns would look like? <laughs> Track number 10 in the setlist, they go on to do Blasphemous Rumours, very similar to the 101 version, and a lot of these uh, versions of these songs were quite similar to the 101 sort of versions, because they, I mean, they used a lot of the same sounds and a lot of the same backing tracks, and the Blasphemous Rumours version was brilliant. Um, what can I say? Next song. Told you so, told you so, told you, told you so, told you so, told you so, told you so. Oh my God, what a track. And <laughs> this is the moment of the show where Dave gets completely unhinged and just loses it. And it's, <laughs> I always said that it's quite funny that I think that when Martin sang Somebody, Dave went backstage and I don't know what he took, but when he came back and did, what did he do, lie to me, and then by the time told you so came on, whatever Dave had taken backstage had kicked in and he, he just went. And another way I like to talk about told you so, it's Dave gone versus the speaker. I'm not taking any shit from the speaker, Dave gone said. I'll handle this. What a tune. Uh, that melody is kind of related to World In My Eyes. Um. Can you see? It's kind of, it's not, it's, it's kind of related. Told You So was completely erratic and watching it the other day it just blew my mind and I was completely sober when I watched it but I'd like to watch it after a bottle of wine and just see the effect but yeah what a performance what a song they went on to do Master and Servant which was obviously a big hit for them at that time um, Interesting thing I noticed about Master and Servant uh, when I was watching it the other day, and this is just completely for you geeks out there, is that it, act, you know something, I've heard this for so many years, but I never noticed that it actually key changes. So it starts off here. You know, it gets to that. Dun, 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 dun. Come on, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. Light life. And then at the end, it goes to. That's just a geeky observation. It key changes. Can't say much about it. Brilliant version of Master and Servant. I don't think I've actually ever heard a bad version of Master and Servant. Uh, it's one of the songs they always seem to pull off quite well. Unlike that Barrel of Guns song, which is another story. Um, Master and Servant is a song that always comes out, they always manage to pull off well. They then go on to do Photographic, which is the definitive, the Penultimate, the perfect live version of Photographic ever. Absolutely love it. And I'd like to do a breakdown of this song, uh, you know, in, in a separate video. But what I left about the, just a few sort of improvisations, where it goes, I take pictures. On the record it goes, I take pictures. Photographic pictures. But, the live version, it goes... Just a slight variation, but um, just a geeky observation. And I love at the end they do that solo, but in, what's interesting is, you know, usually Alan would do a lot of the solos, but Martin actually did the solo at the end of this. Um, so I'm going to break it down for you. Um, Alan just goes... He just plays those two parts uh, throughout the song towards the end. And then Martin does the... Now 
Now I want to geek out a little bit, and um, I'm going to play you. Um, I'm going to play you Alan's part in my left hand, and I'm going to play Martin's part in my right hand. Uh, but I've also I'm going to play it over a backing track. I quickly knocked up. So if you're a purist, a purist, don't have a go at me. This backing track is just for demonstrational purposes. Right, let's hit it. Right, Alan's part. That was the best version of Photographic ever. They then went on to do a great crowd pleaser, Everything Counts. Um, very similar to the 101 version. Um, as I say, if it's, if it's not broke, don't fix it. They found a way of doing songs and, and it's no, it doesn't surprise me that they repeated that formula and did those songs very similar throughout the years because if it's not broken, don't fix it. So, like, you know, if it works, there's no need to add a drum kit to a, a band that works perfectly well without it. <laughs> See You was the next song. Um, See You was a song that I think Martin wrote when he was about, I think, 12 or... He, he wrote it when he was really young, and it's, it's a really naive kind of love song. Um, but, wow, listening back to it now in retrospect, um, it has a place. And this was a great version of See You. Have I actually said anything bad about this concert yet? They then went on to do Shout. And I must admit, when I first saw this on, on the VHS recording, I'd never heard this song before. I was like, wow, this is incredible. Uh, it's got that... Duh, duh. I don't even know if that's the right... But it's that kind of sound. It reminds me a little bit of Gary Newman's... got that kind of brilliant what's a brilliant version of shout they then ended it with just can't get enough which was the absolute showstopper um, and that was the best version of just can't get enough ever I just love the the improvised ending and Alan Wilder going the dum dum the you know playing those bass samples they were real sort of like FM bass sounds have I actually said anything bad about I have I, this is probably a really biased I don't have anything bad to say about the show guys it was just absolutely if you look at it now in retrospect you know, I loved it at the time and I love it now. In fact, I love it more now uh, than I used to. So the verdict, I love the way it looked. I love the way it sounded. It had a very sort of honest sound to it. If you compare it to sort of 101, um, you know, if you see him singing with a microphone and the microphone had a chord on it, it was, it was, it, it had a kind of like a, like a rawness. It had kind of like a club vibe kind of feel to it. Although, the, I mean, that venue probably took about maybe five, six thousand people, I don't know. I think this would have been a great concert to attend, you know, to see Depeche Mode in their prime in a, you know, and it was innovative and new and, you know, to sort of see them in a venue of that si size as opposed to an arena where you need binoculars to see them. I think this would have been a great time to see them. Yeah, the sound, the performance, the set listing, the tempos and everything, I just can't fault this. So um, if I was going to rate this concert, guys, I'd give it a perfect 10 um, and I'd love to know your, your feelings on it as well. Right guys, and on the back end of this video, I just want to make a few shout outs. Um, it did make me smile last night um, when I got a notification on my Vaughn George Facebook page, a video clip from one of my subscribers and one of the sort of most supportive members from the beginning, early days, a young lady who calls herself uh, Mary. Um, 
she left this video clip um, where she just said, you know, hello to the Vaughan George group and they were out in Moscow celebrating <laughs> the, uh, the Fletcher's birthday and I'm just like, Fletch, Fletch is such a legend, he even gets birthday parties in, birthday parties by proxy, people celebrate his birthday in Moscow, I mean Fletch, what a legend, you know. <laughs> But yeah, Mary, thank you very much. So Mary, as she calls herself, went on to say that she met a guy at this club who was actually a subscriber of my channel. And um, I would like to give a special shout out to Mary and Sergei. I hope you enjoyed the uh, Fletch birthday party last night in Moscow. And I would love to hang out with you guys when I eventually make it to, to Moscow. Right guys, and there is a Vaughan George Facebook page which is related to this uh, YouTube channel and uh, it's a great, great group. I'm really, really enjoying the interactions. Um, I'd love to invite you there. Please uh, request uh, permission to join and either myself or one of my admins will uh, grant you permission. And it's, believe me, it's, it's a lot of fun. Right guys, and as always, I'm so grateful to you for your support and for those of you who have been with me all the way. And those of you who have just joined, welcome to the community. Um, please click like and subscribe and feel free to share this video with anyone you think would be able to zone into the madness that we have in this group. Guys, I'm so grateful to you, love you all and I will see you in the next video. All the best.